I'm Katherine Quinn, and you're watching Disney Channel. Hi friends, my name is Katherine Quinn. I am a 30-something living in New York City, working on Broadway, and I used to work for Disney. I am a former Disney cast member, and I want to talk about my experiences, how I got cast, where I worked, any advice that I would offer, and some things that you might not know about being a Disney cast member. Let's get into it. I'm gonna mark chapters throughout this video in case you're just interested in my Tokyo Disney experience or if you just wanna hear about my Disney Cruise Line experience, you can skip ahead to that part of the video. But first we're gonna talk about Tokyo Disney and how this whole Disney journey even got started. I grew up in the Disney Renaissance. I know, a gift. I grew up when Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast. I was born just after A Little Mermaid, but all of those movies were the movies of my youth. Grew up going to the movie theater, seeing those incredible shows, The Lion King, and just loving them. So I've been a Disney fan forever. The idea of working at Disney had always been appealing to me, but I also didn't grow up thinking I would become a performer in any way. So I didn't really think it would be an opportunity. Halfway through college, I ended up doing a summer stock show, had an amazing experience and decided to pursue theater. I smushed my BFA in theater into two years, which you don't need to work in the parks, graduated, and then I started performing. The first show that I did out of school was a three theater dinner theater tour. Our first stop was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Then we traveled to Florida and then we traveled to Mesa, Arizona. While we were in Mesa, Arizona. Mesa is a suburb-ish of Phoenix. Some friends and I took our one day off because in theater you often work a six day week. We took our one day off, drove overnight after our evening show to Los Angeles and we did a day of auditioning in LA just to have the experience. My friends really wanted to audition for a production of A Chorus Line. Bye. Yeah, so we did the Chorus Line audition, did our callbacks, lived the dream, and I was like, oh my God, I should see if there are any Disney auditions. So I think the site is disneyauditions.com. I'll verify and put the link right here. And the only Disney audition they had was not for California, not for Florida, but for Tokyo Disneyland. I am primarily, or at least at the time, was a dancer. And the only call that they had that day was for singers. So I was like, you know what? It's 16 bars of music. It's 16 bars of my life. What do I have to lose? I'm gonna go. So I did. So I sang my 16 bars and they were like, fantastic, Catherine. There were like five people in the room. That holding room, I will never forget. There were people literally dressed up in Disney princess costumes. In case you're interested in becoming a Disney cast member, that is not necessary. And in fact, not preferred. If Disney princess is the thing that you're going for, you want something that's moderately form fitting because regrettably, one of the things about Disney is, it depends on the show, but Disney princesses are not particularly body inclusive and they will measure you. So there's that fun part. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Saying my 16 bars, there were five people behind the table. There was the head of Disney Entertainment casting across everything, and I think parks as well. But then there were two or three folks who came in from Tokyo Disney, Japanese Disney cast members. And then of course the monitor in the room. In case you don't audition much, the monitor is just the human who helps bring you in and out from the holding space. So did my audition, they were like, fantastic. Catherine, we would love to invite you to a callback. And I think I had exited the room the monitor came out and said, hey, can you come back to callbacks tomorrow? And I said, no, I have shows in Arizona tomorrow. And they said, hold on one second, went back in the room, came back and presented me with five sides of music, no keyboardist, no one to learn from, not songs that I knew. And I literally was like, okie dokie. Yep, I'm gonna learn these right now. And they said, we'll just slot you in later in the day today. Just tell us when you're ready. You can go out and learn these. Pulled out a keyboard app and like frantically plunked out the notes and tried to more or less teach myself these songs. I think maybe I quickly looked on YouTube to see what the songs more or less sounded like. And I think like 30 minutes or less later, I came back in and I said, okay, let's do this. So went in, did the callback. And I was like, oh, I really wanna be in the show Big Band Beat which is like a fun, jazzy, 1940s vibe show at Tokyo Disney Sea, like so fun. And they were like, no, no, no. We're gonna look at you for Slew Futsu at the Diamond Horseshoe. I'll throw a photo up here, which is funny to me because she's like a big grassy broad and she's usually like, you know, five, six, five, seven and up, big blonde bouffant, Texan, whatever. Incidentally, I'm from Texas, but that personality could not be further from my own. So I was like, okay, 
we are acting today. I remember they made me improv while I was in the room. They were like, welcome everyone as though they're in a saloon in a Texas accent. And I was like, okay, well that part I can probably do. And they like had me do some different exercises like that. And I sang my callback sides and they were like, great. Now go into this other room, slip on those character shoes, those Leducas, and we're gonna teach you a dance combination. You're gonna go do it by yourself. Okay, so imagine this, I'm going into the audition room, everyone who wants to audition, everyone who is auditioning, they're auditioning for the same thing and for princesses and for Big Man B are all in that holding room in the audition studio watching me have my callback, nightmares. So I'm like, okay, this is fine. So I go out, I learn, you know, the however many eight counts. And it's not super hard choreography. It's primarily, you know, singer track, but they want people who can move. They brought in the casting folks from where they were auditioning other people, came in, watched my little callback. They conversed and I hung out. And I, meanwhile, I'm like texting my friends who are at other calls in LA. They're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I am still at this Tokyo Disneyland call. Anyway, you have to remember that this was 10 years ago. So they go converse. I know this is a thing and people who like are better versed in Disney auditions will know this better than I do, but like there's different color slips that they have you fill out and they mean different things. And I think it was a pink slip, maybe? I genuinely don't really remember, but they were like, we're now gonna take your measurements, is that okay? And I was like, yup. And they were like, does it sound fun living in Japan? And I was like, yeah. You know, no part of me had planned on this. This was not like some, you know, like Disney, yeah, super exciting. But like beyond that, this was not the plan. But like, I'm a very like, yes kind of gal. So I was like, sure, this sounds super fun. So they take my measurements, then they bring out a scrapbook which now I'm certain must be some sort of iPad that they swipe through, or I don't even know. But they literally brought out this physical scrapbook and they were like, these are photos of the stage in Japan. Does this sound fun to you? And I was like, yes, it does. Cause it did, but I was just so stunned by the entire, like, cause it's just been a couple hours. So that all happened. And they were like, fantastic. We look forward to speaking with you very soon. Oh wait, I must not have gotten in the rental car because my friends had it. I was stranded there because they had to come pick me up. And then they came to pick me up from the audition. And I was like, that was insane. I think I might be going to Japan. I think I need to call my mom and tell her I might be going to Japan. I think I need to call my mom and tell her that I went to audition in LA overnight and now I might be going to Japan. Oh my God, I forgot the part. This is so silly, but it's just like so indicative of this time in life. I literally curled my hair in a Starbucks bathroom and got ready because we drove overnight, as I mentioned, drank my Starbucks, and I remember plugging that curling iron in, hitting high as quickly as I could, turning it up all the way, put on my dress. I was like, oh, that's hot enough. Curled my hair, put in some hairspray, like two minutes later, exited that bathroom and was like, meggy ducky, here we go. Insane, insane youth, so fun. Called my mom, told her I was probably going to Japan, and then I I think I heard like a week later, like it was pretty quick turnaround, maybe by the end of that week. And I got my whole offer and they sent over a giant packet by mail, which now I would imagine they all do digitally, but at the time it was like this wonderful physical packet that I had to mail back. It was crazy, crazy. What was it like working at Tokyo Disneyland? It was amazing. It was amazing. Tokyo is one of the best places in the world. I jogged to the ocean every day. I hiked Mount Fuji over the summer. Crazy stories to share about that. I visited Okinawa. I went to temples. I learned how to taiko drum. I took Japanese lessons, which Disney has a program, or at least they used to, where you could take Japanese lessons, either provided through the company or largely subsidized through the company. The national healthcare in Japan was unbelievable. At the time, again, 10 years ago, but it was $60 for the entire stay, which was crazy. And it was so good. So a lot of people would get like dental care and like things that they needed to do done while they were on contract in Japan because healthcare was so much better. Okay, so some things about working at the park. So the show that I did, as I mentioned, was the Diamond Horseshoe Review. There was a lunch show and a dinner show and I much preferred the dinner show, but there's three slew foot sues and you just take turns on who's doing which shifts that day and three, oh my God, I wanna call him Captain Jack. What is his name? Diamond Jim. And those become your besties. And also once I got there, I realized how deeply weirdly cast I had been. Like these other girls were so much taller, bustier and blonder than I was. And I was just like, no okay, kid, we're here for the ride. And they called me Chisai Su, which is like tiny Su. Cause like I'm five, five on a good day. And they also called me Genki Su because I was very energetic. I was 22, you know, 
23. You sing, yes, you sing both in English and in Japanese. Some of your speech is in English and Japanese. It's an international park, but it is in Japan. Japanese reverence of Disney is unlike anything else. Their musical theater culture has evolved so much in the last decade, but it's still not like as many shows as you can see on Broadway. They very much treat the shows as though they are like Broadway. Like I got a scrapbook when I left from a fan. They'll give you presents. They're very, very devoted to their Disney. It's amazing. So the show that I was in, Diamond Horseshoe Review, was at Disneyland, not Disney Sea. If you ever get to go to Tokyo, please go to Disney Sea. Disneyland is incredible, but it's like similar enough to California and Florida parks. Disney Sea is unlike anywhere else in the world. It's so beautiful. It's so incredible. Tokyo Disneyland is a franchise of Disney. It is the only franchise franchised park, meaning it is not actually owned and operated by Disney. They're using the brand and building their own park around it, which is amazing. Another thing that people might not know is there's a cafeteria on campus and I love Japanese food and I had a great time. And the cafeteria was actually like really solid and very reasonable. Yes, I got to go to the parks for free. Yes, we had special ways that we could enter and exit the park and enter and exit the stage. Anytime we were visible in Disney areas, we needed to be in Disney look or Disney look. I don't know if it's racist to do that. It's just the way they pronounce it. And I loved it. It was very charming. They also have their own version of a downtown Disney, which I can't remember the name of. I'm going to put it right here. That was delicious. And if you ever just need an American burger while you're on contract there, they have a pretty solid one. Housing in Tokyo was super solid. They have a building called E-Village. The park is in Maihama on the Maihama stop and then housing is at Shinrayasu. And the housing is just one stop over. Most of the cast was Japanese and then Diamond Jim and Slewfoot Sue, the two singing tracks, were English speaking and from different parts of the world. Actually, all of the people backstage pretty much speak at least some English and certainly enough to like get the work done. Oh my gosh, this is making me miss Japan and my time there. It's just like, such an incredible culture. It is a very, very respectful culture, sometimes to a fault, but most of the time it's like the most beautiful thing in the world. Case in point, I had friends who left wallets out at Tokyo Disney, wandered the park. Hours later, they returned. Wallet was still there intact. Nothing had been removed. I left my Wi-Fi hotspot on a bus. If you did that in New York City, you would never see it again. Called the bus operator. They told me where to go. Somebody had left it. Like the people are incredible. It's incredible. So housing is great. We each had our own apartment, studio apartment, lovely view. And like Tokyo has incredible public transit that's super clean and super safe. So that was amazing. It was just an incredible, incredible experience. I loved my time there. I took it very seriously as a 22, 23 year old and I was just so nervous about everything. So I think the only advice I'd give myself going back is like loosen up a little and make sure you really travel while you're there. I didn't get to do Sapporo or Kyoto while I was there and I really, really wish I had. I was like, oh, I'll come back. Well, it's been 10 years and I have not been back to Sapporo or Kyoto. I'm sure I will at some point, but it wasn't during that contract and I regret missing out on that. All in all, an absolutely incredible time. Highly, highly recommend. And I just loved it overall. So. That was my time at Tokyo Disney. How the heck did I end up on Disney Cruise Line? So I had open called obviously for Tokyo, like I told you about. Did not do an open call for Cruise Line. So for Cruise Line, someone who was in my company at Tokyo Disney said, you would be an amazing swing given your dance background, whatever. And I had never been a swing before. In case you weren't aware, a swing is somebody who understudies or covers all of the ensemble tracks in a show. And on a ship, that's wild because the ship that I was on had five main stage shows and three or four four theme nights, I guess, total, if you include pirates, and then additional special activities. And my co-dance captain, Swing, and I broke it down once, and there were 98 variations of what we could have done on board. And I ended up doing more than those 98 because I ended up going out for tracks that I didn't even cover. A track is the path that you take in a show. It's like whoever is that ensemble person, if they're friends with Snow White in this number, and then they're a dancer in this number, and then they are one of the Toy Story dancers in this number, that's their track. And so if that person got sick or needed to leave the ship, I would cover it for them. And I'd have my own set of costumes and go in and just do their track, do all of their path on stage, sing their part in the show, dance their part in the show, all of that stuff. While I was at Tokyo, somebody who had done Disney Cruise Line previously was like, you'd be an amazing swing dance captain. And I was like, that's a dream. I would love to work on Disney Cruise Line. So I YouTubed all of the shows because people have recorded them or bits and pieces or live online. I looked at what the shows were on each of the ships. At the time, there were only four ships. Now there's like a bazillion of them. There's six and there's gonna be like 13. And I found that the shows that I loved the most and that felt the best for me 
were on the wonder. So my friend submitted me and said, hey, there's someone here. P.S. this is a very unconventional way to get this job and I know it's very annoying and I can't advise doing this because I have tried to submit people this way and it didn't work. So it was like a right place, right time. They needed a swing, all that jazz. I will say swings are very valuable. If you do have like a swing brain, then it can be a good way to sort of get your foot in the door, particularly if you pitch yourself that way because not everyone wants to be a swing. It's very hard and occasionally thankless, but when you get to swing on, you're the hero. So I curated my submission tape perfectly around the shows that I fell in love with were all in the Disney Wonder. At this time, I think two of these shows are still the same. Disney Dreams, Golden Mickeys, and Toy Story, which has retired, which is for the best. Even though you tried to terminate me, revenge is not an idea we promote on my planet. Those were the three primary mainstay shows, Welcome Board, Farewell Show, and then three theme nights, Disco, whatever the cowboy one was, and then one of the ones, and then Pirates. Anyway, the three primary mainstay shows that I was like, okay, those are the ones that there's something for me in there, were on the Wonder. So I literally like, picked my side so that it was like perfect for those shows. I was like, clearly I can cover this person in this show. Clearly I am right for this show. Clearly I can do this for this show. Filmed the stuff at E-Village, which was the housing for us at Tokyo Disney, and had little rehearsal rooms, which was incredible. Sent it in and got an offer. And they said, hey, are you available for our next Wonder contract? It starts one week after you finish in Japan. And I said, Yes, the itinerary that I was on was absolutely incredible. You rehearsed two months in Toronto first, which I'll come back to. Then you embark the ship. We embarked in Florida. We went through the Panama Canal, which was really, really cool. Up the coast of California, and then we were out of Vancouver doing Alaskan cruises all summer. Then we went back down the coast of California through the Panama Canal again and did Caribbean cruises throughout the fall. And then the total contract was 10 and a half months, which is a long time. So two months of rehearsal and then eight and a half months on board. Really quite a long time to live on a ship, but we made it through and it was great. So rehearsals are in Toronto. They put you up in beautiful apartments. My understanding is it's not quite as fabulous as it used to be, but I think the apartments are still beautiful. You're just usually sharing a room. And I had this stunning giant apartment to myself, which was amazing. We were there in like February, which was frigid. Oh my God, Toronto was so cold. The rehearsal studios in Toronto are so beautiful. The teams that work there, top of the line, they're incredible. The thing that I hated the most was assessment day. So they essentially re-audition you on day one, which has happened for me on other contracts. It happened in my Tuacon contract. And it's because they audition so many people. They work with so many people. And now, having run auditions myself as a director choreographer, I get it. And now I'm like, ugh, okay, you have to remind everyone you already have the job. This is just to see what your skill set is and where we want to fit you into the shows. But you are effectively auditioning again in front of your peers, and it is mortifying. You have to climb a rope. There's a strength test. There's like so much. There's different kinds of combinations that you have to do. And then you have to sing in front of each other as different princesses. And I found the whole thing completely humiliating, but it's just part of the deal. But also I'm not a normal performer. The one thing I will never forget, so sorry, Jeff, or if Jeff's wife Erica happens to watch this, the one thing you'll never forget, there's a circle of life pas de deux, which is so beautiful, it's a nice leg extension, all this stuff. And I learned it with this person in my cast named Mikey, who was massive. He was our Tarzan, and he was big and strong and like six, three, and he could just lift me into oblivion. And of course, they're like, Catherine, we would love to see you do the pas de deux with Jeff. I love Jeff. Jeff was my co-dance Captain Swing. He's one of my best friends to this day. Like my respect and love for him, top tier top tier, one of the best humans in the world. He is a slight man. He is about my height. And at the time, he was really lean, like really lean. And I was very thin at that time, but I also packed some muscle. I had not been learning the routine with Jeff and it, oh man, yep, that audition happened. Anyway, I didn't get to cover that track. It's fine. Actually, it really is fine if I had plenty of other things to do. Rehearsal studios are so beautiful. Housing was absolutely incredible. Had an amazing time, loved it. Fly down and you do traditions, which is like Disney brainwashing camp, but I loved it. They barely train you for a character greeting while you're in Toronto. So you definitely still have to character greet, but maybe the training has gotten better. Character greeting is what the main stage performers who are like singing and dancing and we have our faces and all of that stuff and doing the thing on stage with all the incredible characters. We're responsible for basically bodyguarding them, but also negotiating the lines of people waiting to greet them and all of that stuff. So you have to do character breakfasts and you need to do princess greeting, which was the most fun one. I will not spoil it, but I just will share that there's like a magical moment in rehearsal where like you get a very special experience and like step into what it's like to be a character. And then they sort of emotionally manipulate you and it's magical and a tradition 
in and that's all I'm gonna say about that. It's a fun day. On the ship, you're doing things that you would never do anywhere else, right? Like you're in Toy Story, we were wearing wearable puppets, like as Mr. Potato Head. Also, Baby Head, that creepy little spiky dude who's one of Sid's evil toys. Thank God this show is retired. I don't know, I'm sure Baby Head is like in a landfill somewhere. And it was a boy track that I ended up having to go on for because all the boys got sick at the same time. You had these like tendrils and you spun around and ah, just terrifying, horrible. The other weird things that you would have to do, Spanish web, which is not that weird on a cruise ship. Like aerial work is kind of far for the course. I'll show what Spanish web is up here as well, but you climb up a rope, you lock your hand in and you learn. And of course this was in the Tarzan sequence and you're a monkey. So they fly you down to Disney, you're there for traditions. You get your keys to the kingdom and you get to go underneath Main Street USA and you get to see backstage at Disney and all of that fun stuff. Then you get on board, you continue your traditions training. While you're there, you're sharing space with the current cast. So there's an overlap period while you're getting onboarded and teching into the shows and all of that stuff while the current cast is there. Our experience was really special because we literally got on board as the current cast was saying goodbye to somebody who got fired for drinking too much. So you're a petty officer on board because you also have to do safety training on the first day of the ship. I was responsible for H, assembly station H, can you hear me? H as in Hercules. Attention everyone, in the unlikely event of emergency, if you hear seven short blasts of the short whistle followed by one long blast of the whistle, please gab, blah, 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 you know. I was that human with like a megaphone wearing my little white. Tech is crazy. You're on a rocking ship and I was on the Wonder, which is one of the smaller ships so you feel the boat a little bit more. Bigger ships, you don't tend to feel as much. Some of those roughs these days, are rough. You could have a no-fly show where you cut the flying and you do something else, but doing that monkey with like strobes and like the ship is rocking, rough. There were tiny lifts in the stage and in the welcome aboard show, they have a new welcome aboard show now, but in the one that we did, you come up in a little salute in a bevel with Minnie Mouse. I think I have a photo of this that I could throw up right here. You come up in a little elevator in the stage that I swear is like the size of the chair I'm sitting in right now. It's so small. Minnie's head is ginormous and right next to me. Like we would all sort of like squeeze, 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 squeeze and then we're like out of the lift. But in a bevel and the ship is doing like this and Minnie Mouse is like literally a centimeter away. Wild, wild, things you'd never experience anywhere else, but a very fun time. The quality of the entertainment on Disney ships is appropriately, absolutely incredible. I was so proud to be a part of the shows. I was so proud to watch the shows. They looked incredible. The performances were incredible. The caliber of performers is exceptional. So I felt really, really good about the work that we were doing on stage. Now let's talk about things that aren't on stage. Living on a ship is not for the faint of heart, and it was for me once. There are people who do multiple contracts and not every single cruise line treats their crew the same way. That's for so many different reasons, which I'll unpack a little bit, but I had my own cabin, which is a gift, a blessing, a luxury when you're a performer on a cruise ship. Dancers, most often, there's a weird, weird hierarchy, really in theater in general, but particularly on cruise ships. As somebody who's done dancing and singing contracts, dancing is so much harder. A dance contract is so much harder. Singer contracts make more money and get better perks. It's just the way it goes. So I did have my own cabin, but the dancer tracks on the show shared cabins, characters share cabins. I think most of the crew shares cabins, but officers and main stage performers who are singer tracks and dance captain swing get their own cabin. There are a couple cabins on the Wonder in the crew land where you can have a porthole. There's like two. I did not get one of those. So I was in what was called Herc Highway right underneath the Walt Disney Theater on deck four. And it was very cozy and Herc Highway was super fun and social. It was like very college dorm vibes. Some of these people from this contract are my best friends to this day. So would not give that up for anything. And also I wouldn't give the experience up for anything. I mean, I got to go dog sledding in Alaska and take floater planes and helicopters. And you know, I mean, the, all of the experiences were absolutely incredible. There's tons of arbitrary rules that are really, 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 really infuriating. A lot of things around food, a lot of things that you can't have in your cabin. I'm sure these are all for safety reasons. There's there's no leniency, there's no sense of humanity when it comes to enforcing those. And it's hard to go from the outside world or even rehearsals where you're in charge of all the food that you're putting in your body and have access to the outside world and amenities and then to be on a ship and have a lot of that limited. It's tough. I will also say having visited friends, particularly on Royal Caribbean, the treatment of 
performers on Royal is so much nicer than Disney. Disney was fine. You're supposed to kind of disappear. Like they don't really want to see the performers outside of the shows. Whereas on other cruise lines, it's like, look at these hot performers we have. They want you to get dressed up in nice dresses. They want you around deck. You wear your little name tag. People want to recognize you. They want to talk to you about the shows, all of that jazz. And I think because we're supposed to sort of like whitelist into the Disney of it all, they don't want guests to really recognize performers. Sometimes they would when we did character greetings, but that's kind of it. And you're in those really attractive white polos, high-waisted white shorts, and white sneakers. The cafeteria, I absolutely hated. It was truly horrendous. I spent so much money on Wi-Fi, which you have to purchase. There's a thing underneath in crew area called I-95, and I think that's common on ships. I think on most ships, their main thoroughfare for crew is called I-95. Walking past the incinerator, you feel like your nose is gonna burn off. It is so gross. That's where all the trash is literally burned. Getting off in port was my saving grace. But again, the quality of the performance I felt really, really, really proud of, made lifelong friends, and had absolutely incredible experiences. So do I recommend it? 100% yes. Just know what that onboard ship experience is gonna be like, because it is not like being a guest, let me tell you. You can't eat in guest areas either. That may actually have changed. I feel like I've heard a rumor that performers now on DCL can eat up on the top deck where all the pools are, but it used to be that you couldn't eat at any of the restaurants, the top deck, any of it, unless you had a guest on board. And again, with Royal having nicer treatment of performers, you can eat at any of the restaurants, many more privileges. Thank you so much for watching this deep dive on what it was like being a Disney cast member. If you have any questions about my experiences or questions about Disney life in general, leave a comment. I'm pretty good about answering as many questions as humanly possible down there. As always, if you enjoyed this video, liking, commenting, subscribing is the surest way to let the YouTube algorithm know what wonderful people to push my videos out to, people just like you. So it really does make a difference. Thank you so much. Also, I invite you to follow me on Instagram and TikTok at it's Katherine Quinn. I post there all the time. I'm chronically online. And I think that's it for this video. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the comments. Bye.